The first call about the accident in Paris came through to Robin Chamfrin, the Queen's deputy secretary, at one o'clock in the morning. It was from the British ambassador in Paris, who had only sketchy news. Princess Diana had been injured, but no one knew how badly. Chamfrin immediately telephoned the Queen and Prince Charles, who were in Scotland, asleep at Balmoral Castle. Meanwhile in London, the Prince's team were being woken and told the news, ironically, by the Red Top Tablet Press. Their information, which came directly from the emergency services, was more up-to-date than the ambassador's. So Charles knew before the Queen did that Dottie Fayad, the Prince's latest boyfriend, was dead, though Diana was still, at that stage, alive. Never was the relationship between the prince and his mother thrown more starkly into relief than it was on that terrible night. There they were, just feet away in their separate rooms, divided by paper-thin walls, but they didn't go to one another, either for comfort or to discuss logistics. The comforting was left to Camilla, 500 miles away at her home, Ray Mill. Other friends Charles called through what remained of the night. And it was his staff who tried to work out how he could get to Paris as fast as possible to visit his ex-wife in hospital. The most obvious answer was to use an airplane of the Queen's flight, but that required Her Majesty's specific permission and her deputy private secretary was doubtful it would be forthcoming. At 3.45 a.m., the debate became academic. A call came through from the embassy in Paris to say the princess was dead. Camilla had at first thought that Diana's injuries amounted to little more than a broken arm, which is what Charles had been told. So when he rang at 3.45 a.m. with the news that Diana had just died on the operating table, she was as shocked as he was, and terrified for him. They spent a long time on the phone for what remained of the night. Charles knew immediately that the public reaction would be, they would blame him. The world would go mad, he thought, and the monarchy could end up being destroyed. He said as much to his deputy private secretary, Mark Boland, and Boland knew, just as Camilla knew, that these fears were justified. And the children, he was absolutely dreading the moment he had to tell them their mother had died. Should he wake them and tell them straight away, or let them sleep until the morning? It was the Queen, in the end, who said they should be left to sleep. The next day felt utterly surreal. Thousands of people came out to line the 14-mile route between RAF Northolt, where the plane landed with his sad cargo, and the Chapel Royal at St. James Palace, where Charles had insisted the princess should be taken. The prince, who had taken Diana's two sisters with him to Paris, then flew straight back to Scotland to be with his sons. There followed the most extraordinary and dangerous week for the royal family, who remained in the highlands while the rest of the country went crazy. Their reasoning couldn't have been better, and in the long run, I think, was right. They felt the two grief-stricken princes, then just fifteen and twelve, were the priority, and they needed some time to adjust before being confronted with the public outpouring of emotion. Meanwhile, the country paid for their monarch to show her face in London and fly the Buckingham Palace Royal Standard at half-mast. There was a good reason, of course, why this hadn't happened. Traditionally, it only ever flies when the monarch is in residence and never at half-mast. Yet the absence of the flag seemed symbolic of everything that was wrong with the monarchy, stiff and out of touch compared with everything that was so perfect about Diana, warm, compassionate, and loving. Meanwhile, from Balmoral, there was no word, no tribute, just news that the boys had gone to church with the family on the morning their mother died. Business as usual. 
The family was not unaware of what was going on in London. Plenty of people were telling them, but Charles knew better than to say anything. The bulk of the blame, as he had anticipated, was directed at him. Not at Dodie, not even at Dodie's father, Harold's owner, Mohammed al Fayed, who had supplied the car and the driver who hurled through Paris at dangerous speed or the bodyguard for failing not to stop him. No, for many people, the real villain was Charles. If he had loved Diana as he should have done, if he had honored his marriage vows and not committed adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles, then the princess would have never been racing through the streets of Paris without proper police protection. In the days following Diana's death, Charles went for a long walk over the Scottish heather and cried. He's a deep emotional man and he weeps very easily, as does Camilla. On this occasion, the tears flowed copiously, but they weren't tears of guilt. In many ways, Diana had been the ex from hell. She'd spied on him, made it difficult for him to see his sons, upstaged him, embarrassed him, leaked stories to the press. But a part of Charles still loved her. She was the mother of his sons, and he loved her for that, if nothing else. He wept bitterly at the sheer tragedy of it all, that their life together, which they had both so wanted to work, should have ended in such acrimony and anger. And he wept for William and Harry, and for his failure to help Diana. He was also deeply worried about Camilla. Within hours of Diana's death, the press were besieging Camilla's home, eager to talk to the woman who had apparently been the cause of so much misery in the princess's short life. That must have been an appalling period for her, and I thought she was courageous and humble and decent, says Julia Cleverton, who worked for the prince for more than thirty years. He was in agony about it. He really was. And the fact that she was prepared to go through all this for him, I think, illustrates what an incredible strong relationship and partnership they had. The Queen had wanted Camilla gone before Diana's death, and felt no differently after it. Her private secretary, Sir Robert Fellows, who was also Diana's brother-in-law, strongly reinforced her view. It was nothing personal. She had been very fond of Camilla in all the years that she had been married to Andrew Parker Bowles, but it was Camilla who had been responsible, wittingly or not, for all the disasters that had befallen Charles since his marriage. The Queen's stance was one of monarch, not mother, and therein lay the problem. Her son badly needed support, and Camilla had given it to him. She had rescued him from the depth of depression, given him love, comfort, approval, and tenderness that had been so awfully lacking from any other quarter. Amid conflicting advice, the prince decided to go back on the road at the end of September, visiting various projects in Manchester. He was particularly encouraged to do so by Julia Cleverdon, his former charity as advisor. Diana had been dead for less than three weeks. Manchester can be a tough city, and none of them knew what sort of reception he might get. As the plane landed, he straightened his tie in front of a mirror for a second, or two longer than usual, took a deep breath and stepped out to face the cameras. Then, at his first port of call, a Salvation Army centre, he abandoned the speech his staff had helped him to prepare. Speaking from the heart, he thanked the public for their kindness in what had been an unbelievably difficult time, and paid tribute to the courage of his sons. William and Harry had returned to Highgrove after their mother's funeral. Since their separation, Charles had made certain that Camilla was never in the house when the children were present. He had once broached the subject of Camilla with them. It was two months before their mother died, 
and he was hoping to gradually ease his lover into his life. So he sat the boys down together and tried to explain the situation, but both of them went very quiet. He sensed William in particular didn't want to know, so Charles didn't bring the subject up again. As time passed, the prince longed more and more to make Camilla an integral part of his life. He knew this couldn't be done overnight, and above all, he was sensitive to the feelings of William and Harry. More than a year after Diana's death, nothing had yet been decided. By then, William and Harry had met with Camilla's children, Tom, who was the prince's godchild, and Laura. They hadn't seen each other properly since they were children, and Charles had wanted them to get together for Easter. So he'd invited them to stay at Burke Hall, the Queen's mother former residence at Balmoral. And despite the difference in their ages, the four had got on well. William had even told his father he would now like to meet their mother, but Charles didn't press it. One day, William rang from Eton to say he was coming to London for the weekend. His call caught everybody on a hoop. Neither of the boys was expected at York House, where Charles was living at the time, so Camilla was there. She immediately said she'd leave, but Charles said, no, stay, this is ridiculous. He then rang William to tell him that Mrs. Parker Bowles was in the house, and to ask if that would be a problem. To which his son had answered no. Prince William wasn't expected till seven that evening, but he turned up at half past three and went straight up to his apartment at the top of the house. Camilla was with her assistant, Amanda McManus, and feeling decidedly anxious as they all were. Charles came to find her. He's here, he said. Let's just go and get with it. I'm going to take you to meet him now. Then he took her upstairs, introduced her to his son, and left him alone to talk. About half an hour later, Camilla came out saying, I need a gin and tonic. She was joking. It had gone well. William was friendly and Camilla was sensitive enough to know things had to go at his pace. She was a mother, after all, and understood how conflicting and difficult it was for him to meet her, particularly now that his mother was no longer alive. A few days later, William and Camilla met for lunch, and then she started spending the odd night in York House when he was there. To celebrate their father's half-century in November 1998, William and Harry threw him an advanced surprise party at Highgrove on July 31st, with his godchildren and their parents among the guests. There was also one very special guest, Camilla. Whether or not it was because they knew she'd be there, Charles' parents stayed away from their grandson's party. However, all the prince's siblings attended, including Prince Anne, who, not without reason, Camilla found terrifying. Anne is a notoriously abrasive woman. The party was a huge success. Charles was enormously touched by the trouble his sons had gone to, and by the fact that they invited Camilla and put her in pride of place. Yet, when the Queen gave an official 50th birthday party for Charles at Buckingham Palace on November 13, attended by a thousand people to celebrate his public work, Camilla, quite rightly, wasn't invited. It was one of the rare occasions when Charles' mother has praised him in public for his diligence, compassion, and leadership and he, in thanking her, delighted everyone by calling her mummy. Despite the warm speeches, the prince was infuriated by his mother's continued hostility towards the woman he loved. The following evening, there was another big party at Highgrove on his actual birthday, organized for him by Camilla and their friends, the Earl and Countess of Shelburne. It was an extravagant event with 350 guests among them foreign royals, politicians, actors, artists, comedians, and even Camilla's ex-husband, Andrew Parker Bowles, and their two children. The two people Charles really wanted to be there, however, stayed away. 
His parents had turned down the invitation, as had all three of his siblings. It was a watershed in his relationship with his mother. The Queen's presence at the party would have indicated, if not approval, at least a tacit acknowledgement of the woman who had meant so much to him for so long. But it was not to be. Indeed, the relationship between Buckingham Palace and St. James Palace, mother and son, and the all-important courtiers through whom they communicate could not have been worse. So in February 1999, when the younger and more amenable Robin Chanfrin took over from Diana's brother-in-law, Robert Fellows, as the Queen's private secretary, there was a sigh of relief at St. James Palace. 